Um, here today from Sky to do a presentation on OpenStack in the enterprise. Um, <coughs> we um, do some introductions and then uh, a bit of background about Sky and the multiple businesses it has and what our objective was um, to deliver cloud and why we needed it. Um, being an enterprise, we needed to integrate into the, the usual uh, enterprise ecosystem. I'll talk about that for a short while. And uh, my colleague will talk about upgrading OpenStack. And we'll talk about running OpenStack as a BAU support operation. And then some of our multi-tenancy users and their issues. So I'm Matt Smith. And this is Alan Chibita. Uh, we both work at Sky in the OpenStack team. And for the past two years, we've sort of architected, delivered, grown, and supported the OpenStack platform. So Sky is a company, uh, 30,000 employees, <coughs> got something like 22 million subscribers. Uh, our primary business is satellite TV. <coughs> we've got lots of businesses. I'll talk through a few of them. So um, we're also a a telco and ISP with SkyTalk delivering uh, telephony to our customers' homes and broadband with DSL and fiber to customers' homes. Uh, we do uh, some online TV with SkyGo and Now TV, and uh, that delivers both video on demand and live TV to customers' homes over the internet. Uh, so Sky Media, so advertising sales for Sky channels and other terrestrial channels. So <clears throat> what problem are we trying to solve? So we're a technology company, and we have around 3,000 developers developing software for our set-top boxes, uh, uh, broadcast uh, processing systems, uh, the advertising sales, the online TV, online shop. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, uh, technology-driven uh, between the business and the customers. So. We've got lots of development teams, lots of applications, and we need somewhere to host these applications. Uh, we needed a, a sort of uh, one delivery mechanism. So instead of having a sort of cloud islands delivering uh, different applications, different clouds, and different uh, sets of infrastructure, we wanted a, a sort of single API, uh, single uh, roadmap for our cloud. And it had to deliver software-defined networking and software-defined storage into a full software-defined data center that was multi-tenant. And the only product that we could find, and still is, is, the, is OpenStack. So we looked at lots of enterprise vendor products, and they were, um, you'd have to sort of stitch them together and create, a, create like a Franken-Cloud, whereas the OpenStack, is, uh, it's got one roadmap going forward, and it's all fully integrated from the ground up, del delivering everything software-defined in the data center. One of the key drivers is cost, so we're always uh, told to keep our costs down, and OpenStack, we had to compare OpenStack against public cloud, sorry, public cloud providers, and also um, against the enterprise software that was uh, available. And I'm sort of glad to say that OpenStack beats all the others by a, a really wide margin. So what we've delivered in our data centers is uh, we've got many data centers, two uh, primary ones, and uh, we've delivered uh, two regions, OpenStack regions, with multi-availability zones in each region. There's something like 80 plus tenants or OpenStack tenants on, on the platform with around 400 users creating instances, networks, uh, load balancers, ports, uh, storage, um, all self-service, and, and they sort of uh, deliver their infrastructure themselves or create it themselves and then deploy their applications on themselves. So, and they use like, many different uh, processes for this. One is Heat, so they're, they're quite uh, expert at using Heat and also Ansible. Uh, from a data center uh, uh, footprint perspective, something like 7,000 cores and 400 terabytes of storage. We initially uh, deployed ISAS a couple of years ago. Uh, we went through an upgrade to Kilo earlier in the year. Alan will talk about that and the sort of processes we went through to get that done. And uh, from an end user perspective, they see services, our OpenStack services. So they're Nova, uh, Cinder, Glance, Keystone, 
Uh, we do uh, Cinder uh, presents through the Ceph storage. We also do Redus Gateway for object storage. We have Neutron, and we do both uh, provider type VLAN and provider type overlay networks. And we also have Heat and Solometer, so users use Heat and they, they can combine that with our Solometer to do auto scaling. Go through a couple of the applications hosted on the platform. So we, we have sort of customer facing applications like Sky Tickets, where Sky sells uh, event and music tickets to uh, the public. We have um, a Sky Q box, which is uh, in the customer's homes, and we push software to the Sky Q box, and we also retrieve uh, customer <coughs> journey information back into our OpenStack cloud. And that's sort of processed, and we, we make the, the UI journey better for the customers uh, analyzing this data. We also have business to business applications. So there's a uh, VOD portal that we transfer information or video assets between Sky UK, Sky Italia, and Sky Deutschland. And we also transfer video assets in and out of studios like Sony Pictures and Paramount. And we also got sort of like high profile applications. So there's, we have a, a CEO dashboard, and this is a, a, a collation of all the information and data from across Sky, so sales of going through the call center, people watching Sky Go and Now TV, people watching Premiership Football, uh, how many people are connected to broadband, a full sort of one pane of glass for the chief executive officer and his executive team who use that to gauge how the business is running. So it's, it, it's sort of hosting every sort of application from customer folk facing, uh, executive office facing, uh, customer homes and business to business. So, when we uh, uh, started with OpenStack, we could have just put it in the corner of the data center and uh, said, you know, you're on your own. But the users who deploy their applications to it expect a certain level of service and uh, integration into the enterprise ecosystem. <clears throat> so we, um, we initially started integrating, we integrated our Keystone into Active Directory. So uh, the end user has a single uh, sign-on type experience, so they log into the desktop, they can log into OpenStack and use the CLI using the same credentials. We integrated um, OpenStack into uh, ServiceNow, so we use ServiceNow for instant management, change management, CMDB, so any instance that gets created is uh, populated into a uh, ServiceNow CMD, and that links into sort of incident management, so when an application is running on our cloud, the, the user can be confident that when they deploy their monitoring, it's, uh, it's connected through the CMDB into in incident management and provides a, the right call-out mechanism. Uh, it's also integrated into OpsView and OpenView, so all the OpenStack services connect into there and OpenView, and that feeds back into incident management and um, uh, the, the call-out uh, enterprise system. Also, uh, for uh, capacity forecasting, so we've, we've had quite a lot of growth on the platform. Uh, we use uh, BMC's capacitor optimizer in the enterprise, and that's connected into our Solometer data, and it drags data out of Solometer, and we can uh, forecast uh, uh, replenishment of servers and growth uh, going forward. And from an end user perspective, we integrated F5 into as a low balance of service provider. So instead of, uh, we've also got HA proxy, but F5 gives a sort of uh, <coughs> enterprise, fully resilient load balancer that our end users can use. So along with the sort of enterprise ecosystem, we um, use the change management. Okay. <laughs> um, change management system in service now for um, keeping keeping all our users informed of uh, changes to the system, any upgrades we're doing, any sort of improvements and, and uh, work that's happening on the platform. And Alan's gonna talk about how we went around uh, upgrading our OpenStack platform. Yep. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, as Matt mentioned, we started our implementation of OpenStack uh, with IceHouse. At the beginning, as a deployment system, uh, we rely on Juju, which is a canonical product mainly because our, our infrastructure is based in Ubuntu. But at some point, uh, we decided to turn Juju off, uh, mainly because the product was doing some things under the hood, and normally we like 
to know what is going on. Um, some points happened that, for example, uh, the Nova controller node um, had a different version rather than the compute nodes, and so we had some issue with that. And so we decided to turn it off. But Juju is not only used for uh, deployments, but it's also used for um, the config changes. You can't do your config changes manually because Juju will overwrite your modifications. And it's also used uh, to deploy new nodes and, uh, <coughs> sorry, and to perform upgrades. So because we turned Juju off, we had to find a new way to deploy to, and manage our infrastructure. And at the beginning, we started with just simple batch scripts pointing to a, an HTTP server from when we grab some config files and then do our modifications. But now we ended up using uh, Ansible, which we think suits perfectly our needs. Mm. This will not be a sort of technical guy on how to perform the upgrade because obviously the time is too short. Rather, just be some suggestions based uh, on our experience that might help you to solve or prevent some of the issues we had during our upgrade path. The upgrade path itself, it's quite simple. I mean, just some, you have to modify some config files. Uh, if you're using Ubuntu like us, it's apt-get this upgrade and perform a DB schema upgrade on the OpenStack components. But obviously, using the right options and the right config files, it could be, could be really challenging, mainly because, as far as you know, there's no official or unofficial documentation on how to perform upgrades. This was the biggest issue we found, and uh, I think if you ever try to perform an upgrade, the documentation is really poor or can reach zero to, in terms of quantity. So where to start from then? Well, there are some places you can start to look at. First one was just to look at the OpenStack config uh, sorry, at the, yes, the, um, at the installation guide. Installation guide uh, can provide some really good examples. So you can try to compare these examples provided with your examples, try to find differences and additions. And it's quite a good, good place to start with. Then another great place is to look at the config, OpenStack config uh, reference manual. Look especially for deprecated and new options. This happens quite often between each release and sometimes can be quite a nightmare to find which is the right one. Uh, for example, some of the options have been moved from the default section to other specific section. This happened in the transition between Heiser Tequila for, um, for Rabbit for uh, and, and Kisten. Just a few words on Kisten. I think with Kisten we did at the beginning one big mistake which was uh, we use LDAP um, service account. We use, um, our, we use LDAP uh, to authenticate our service accounts. So our, our main default driver is LDAP. And this was fine with ISO, where the, the main concept was still not so mature. And, but with Kiston, we noticed, we, we noticed some big some problems. And mainly because the, you know, for, for Kisten, if you use the main, you can use LDAP as your default, as your driver, or you can use SQL. And um, there is big restriction if you try to use a um, SQL driver and you have multiple domains. The main restriction is that Kisten currently allows only one SQL, SQL driver to be loaded at a time. And if you try to load more than one SQL driver, Kisten Kisten will raise an exception and will, and will fail. Uh, as far as I know, this uh, limitation may be lifted in next version of Kisten. It's still present in Mintaka, and if I'm not wrong, uh, it's still present in Newton as well. So probably in Okata they will do some changes. But so the suggestion is to start your implementation using SQL. If you, if you plan to use multiple domains, use SQL as your, as, as your de default domain with your service account in SQL and enable uh, LDAP authentication for all the other domains for your tenants. Mm. Another great place, this 
probably is the best place to look at if you are performing um, an upgrade, is to look at the release note section. For each uh, OpenStack service, there's always an upgrade note section on the release page with some very useful information on how to perform the upgrade. Um, we found a really good one for Nova, and as far as I know, this was the only place where it was mentioned, is uh, when you do the upgrade from Icehouse to Kilo, you should run a sort of background migration of flavor metadata information for the call in all location to a new location. This will be done in Kilo, will be done automatically on the fly by the Nova Conductor service. But you must perform this operation before, uh, after, immediately after running Kilo, because in Liberty, this new location, uh, the old location for the metadata um, will, be, will be dropped. And the only place where we were able to find this information was the, under the upgrades note. This is sort of CPU intensive process. So if you have a huge number of instances, be aware that possibly you can have sort of CPU, uh, CPU load on your system. But the command is quite simple and has an option to limit the number of objects you are um, transferring. And so it's quite handy. Um, for some project like uh, Designate, for example, I think I spent one month, two months maybe, trying to find how to configure properly Designate, especially in, uh, if you have two regions. We are currently using Designate in, pro in productions. Uh, we find how to configure it looking at Garrett review page under some comments probably of the main developer of Designate, I think. And sometimes you can find useful information, look at Launchpad or Git. Uh, majority of the contributors in Launchpad are, could be the um, developers itself. So sometimes we have people, people or, deeply, or people deeply involved in the project so they know what's going on and you can find useful information about it. On Launchpad, just to mention, we found we had an issue uh, at the beginning doing the Nova DB schema upgrade and on Launchpad, we were able to find a fix. Obviously, Google could be your friend sometimes, even if you don't want. Um, could be a sort of last resort. Uh, talking about services, uh, I think it's widely agreed that you should start with Kiston and do some tests before moving on. If all is okay, try to move to uh, Glance, Cinder, all the other satellite products. It could be Heat, Silometer and leave Nova and Neutron as last services. This is especially useful, I mean, this is important when you're moving from Liberty to Mitaka, because there's, there's a well, there's sort of bug that um, the Nova compute node must be upgraded before uh, the Neutron node. This to prevent the, the logs to be filled up with some warning errors on sort of missing VIF interface. So. And this is not information I was able to find on the upgrade notes section. Mm. Obviously, try to automate as much as possible, this to avoid user errors or to minimize the downtime, especially if you have a huge number of compute nodes, uh, try to parallelize. And obviously, if you're also running GRE networks, overlay networks, this could be really helpful. And it's very important to have a sort of development environment that should match exactly your production environment. This could, it's not always possible because, you know, it could be some data center restriction, some policy restriction or budget restriction as well. Because this is very important because a multi-region environment with different availability zones requires sometimes some extra options that they were not required uh, with a single environment. This happened to us because our dev environment doesn't match exactly our production. This is mainly because of have some data center restrictions and our dev environment lies only on one region. And we had, during the upgrade, we had two main uh, unexpected problems. One was with um, Clowns and Cinder. And we were able to find a solution under the um, config reference manual because a new option was added it was just simple region hyphen uh, name, and you have to specify the region for each glance or send the service. 
And we had another issue with uh, Horizon. Um, you were able to log into the main page, but you couldn't select the, um, the region. We fixed this problem by looking directly to the Python code, because you know, we were just in the middle of the up We just finished the upgrade, so it was a bit of pressure that all the things should work properly. Uh, we, were look we looked at the Python code, and we found how to fix it. So another suggestion, if you try all the other things and you don't know what to do, try if you have the skills or if you're confident with Python language, try to look at the Python code. You can find them. Sometimes could be really useful. And last but not least, this may be the first thing you should have is have a strong rollback and backup, obviously. Uh, I didn't mention before, but uh, our, in our infrastructure for each service, we are running um, for each service. Um, sorry, our services are running on LXC containers. Each service has three LXC containers on three different compute nodes, and on the top of it, we have CoronSync, Peacemaker, and HRProxy. So for us, it's very easy to perform backups. We are just using CP command. We shut down the container. We take a copy of the container to another location, preferably on another server. And in the same way, it's very easy for us to roll back, simply shut down one of the containers, delete, and copy over. So it's quite easy. Some notes on Ceph upgrade. And Ceph upgrade was really straightforward. We are now running GWIL version. It was just an apt get this upgrade, mainly. Just if you're moving to GWIL, be aware that you have to change um, the file ownership on the OSDs from root to Ceph user, which is they just int introduced in this new version, and could be a long process. And then check the compatibility between the Ceph cluster and the Ceph client running on Cinder, Glance, and Compute Nodes, because we faced, <coughs> sorry, we encountered some issues, because we were running an, an older version of Ceph cluster with the newer version of the Ceph clients, and this was, they were not compatible. And to conclude some notes on the Mitaka upgrade, um, the upgrade from ISO of Tequila was a sort of one step upgrade. We were able to move directly from ISO of Tequila without the need of going through Juno. Uh, this is not possible, as far as I know, to, in, uh, for the upgrade to Kilo to Mitaka, so, um, because there are some bugs. So the first step is to upgrade your Kilo environment fully Kilo to the latest version, then move to Liberty. So all your nodes, compute nodes, and all your services must run uh, Liberty code, and then you can move then to Mitaka. The upgrade was quite smooth. Mm, the, the software, I have to say, by itself is really solid, really strong, uh, rock solid, no unpredictable behaviors. Uh, obviously, there are some bugs, which is normal. Um, the first version of Mitaka was quite bad in terms of the upgrade path, uh, especially Kisten. We found some issues on the DB schema migration. Some of the tables were missing, especially if you were running for a long-term kilo version. That's quite funny, but but it, now it's fixed on the latest Mitaka release. And we have some minor issues with um, Glance and Cinder. They are game fixed. There's only one big issue that is still ongoing, which is a QM Liberty bug. I'm not sure if this is present on other distribution other, rather than uh, Ubuntu, but it's still in Ubuntu. Basically, it's due to a bad APAM or implementation. So if you try to lay migrate um, an instance Libverse and QM won't be able to access correctly some portion of the memory, and the process will fail. The fix is quite, is a sort of temporary fix, quite easy. You need to change some config files, one line in Apamo, but the problem is that you have to shut down your instances and power on again. A simple restart is not enough, so it's mean because Apamo takes care of all the process, process running, so in some way you need to recreate a new P, integrate a new PID. Okay, that's all for yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, we've been running this a couple of years now, and we've 
uh, picked up quite a lot of skills in running OpenStack. Uh, we have a support contract with Canonical, and we sort of uh, we sort of triage the problems that come through, and um, we sort of uh, we solve probably about 80% of the problems that we right. encounter with configuration files or um, uh, simple, oh, the, the more easy Linux uh, type things. 20% um, of the stuff that we've sort of come across over the past couple of years, are sort of more low-level libvirt kernel uh, problems that uh, we've handed off Canonical. And over the years, uh, we think Canonical has done a great job. Yep. And sort of reiterating what Alan said about the OpenStack software, we haven't really had any bugs. It's more so, sort of configuration that we've uh, ran into configuration issues. And we sort of solve those ourselves. Whereas the, the issues that we sort of had are generally more to do with Linux or KVM or yeah. network drivers, et cetera. I was going to talk s through some of the issues that we've had. Yeah, as I said, the software is solid, so we didn't have any major issue with OpenStack itself. But many of the issues we had, they caused what there was sort of performance issue. And most of the performance issue we had, they were related to a poor disk performance of the underlying host of the host hosting our containers, especially with MySQL. So be aware that a, My, a bad MySQL performance could affect uh, many services. Firstly, Nova Conductor. At some point, we started to have our logs fed up with many, many warnings and error from Nova Conductor, and we couldn't figure out what's going wrong with Nova. But then, after some debugging, we found that MySQL was performing really bad, and so because we are using, as I said, LXC container, we simply moved our uh, MySQL cluster to another, to a more performant compute, uh, com more performant compute host, and back, the, is the issue is gone. And this sometimes it's really hard to do some debugging, especially performance on OpenStack components, because one, if one service is de doing bad, sometimes it's affecting many other services that. If you look at, they are not strictly related one each other. Um, at some point, someone uh, decided yeah. to rename flavors. So don't do that unless strictly necessary, especially if you're running Kilo. We found sort of bug. Uh, if you try, because there's no Nova flavor rename command. You can do it through Horizon, but basically what Horizon <coughs> does is it deletes the flavor and creates a new one with the same characteristics, but with a different name. But the problem is that there's a sort of mismatch between the Nova flavor, uh, the flavor ID that Nova sees with the flavor ID that actually is in the database. And if you try to resize or line migrate an instance after renaming a flavor, you will see some logs like, I some error log like I can't find a uh, flavor with ID 67, things like that. The problem is fixed now. Canonical did a great job. They, the problem doesn't exist in Liberty. It exists only in Kilo. So they backported basically Kilo functionality, the Kilo fix patch, to, um, the, sorry, the Liberty patch to Kilo, and they provided us the solution. I don't know if it's still uh, available to. I think it is. I think, I don't yeah. know yet. But be aware that, I mean, you can encounter this problem if you try to rename a flavor. We had other two, I mean, we have other two live migration issues with um, in Kilo and in Mitaka. In Kilo, in ISA, I have to say live migration was working fine. As, but as soon as we moved to, um, to Kilo, we started to see some constant failures on live migrations. And absolutely unpredictable, was quite random, constant and random. Um, we isolated the problem and we found that we had to disable the tunneling of the, of the line migration. There's a flag that you can uh, remove from line migration flags inside the Nova config file. And without the tunneling, the line migration was fine. But this caused another issue, which is quite, so was quite bad, critical, because under, we noticed that under heavy I.O., disk I.O., we had constant data corruptions on instances being transferred, and it doesn't matter which was the operating system, so it was 
something inside Libavit. The fix, um, apparently, um, I'm quite sure the, in Liberty this, fix, this problem it doesn't exist anymore. So at the moment, Canonical is still looking uh, at the differences between the QMO package of you know, Kiloversion and Liberty, and they try to figure out what is causing the problem. Uh, then we have a funny issue with uh, load balancers. <coughs> we noticed that some customers had some issue to, if they were using load balancer, the HR proxy, not the F5 driver, but only this, this happened only with the HR proxy. They noticed that uh, they were, uh, weren't able to reach more complicated, let's say, web pages. So if a web page was quite simple, there was no issue. But if the page was quite a little bit more, with more code, with more more complicated, they just get, I can't reach the page. After some debugging, we found that the issue was the empty value of the top interface inside the load balancer namespace, and the fix is quite easy. I mean, you just need to lower the value from 1500 to 1400, but this is not a permanent fix, because as soon as you reboot your compute no your neutral node, the value will re revert back to uh, 1500. So to we, we know that, and so we create this also some alarms and some checks. So we are checking constantly the load balancer MTU value of our load balancer namespaces and uh, interfaces <coughs> on the namespace, and we try to prevent this situation. Uh, this was um, another issue we had recently was the, with NF contract. We noticed that under heavy usage, uh, network usage, some, um, we had sort of constant, consistent packet loss on some of the compute nodes. And the problem uh, was um, about the NF contact table. Uh, basically, it was our mistake because we used a uh, too short value. And the fix was quite easy, just an on the fly fix. You can modify the NF contact table max value. And we did it on the compute node, affected compute nodes, and this solved the issue. Mm. It's very also very important for us, was very critical, uh, the Newton service order restart. Because if you have a big number of network and routers on your neutron node, even if the L3 agent is reported as uh, started, the Newton, uh, the router namespace creation is not complete yet, especially if you have this big number. And because the sequence of restarting is L3 agent, DHCP agent, and then the load balancer agent, the DHCP agent was failing, was fa uh, yeah, was failing to create uh, the interfaces. So if you then try to create an instance, your instance won't get uh, an AP address because the DHCP agent was wasn't ready. The fix is quite easy and simple. We just put a slip command in, on the upstart scripts, so we have. A two agent running uh, after 60 seconds, and the DHCP agent after 70 and or 80, and the load balancer as last start after 90 seconds. Um, so going on back to our users, so it's a multi-tenant environment with sort of 400 users uh, creating instances and networks, etc., all day every day, and we have your novice user and your expert user and everyone in between. So the, the first one we get or get a lot of is I can't ping my instance, and this is sort of a novice thing where they haven't configured their security group or they haven't given their uh, instance a floating IP. We use in Sky quite extensively Slack for collaboration, and we uh, we find that, that that's really useful. That the sort of more experienced users will help along the the less experienced users in in resolving these simpler issues, and that. That sort of relieves us of quite a lot of uh, work in, in sort of training people up. He doesn't know, but we use call this instant support <laughs> using Slack because there's people writing and we immediately have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we we uh, created some problems ourselves. Uh, so when we deployed ISAS originally, we, um, uh, the, the version of OpenV switch that we used wouldn't support uh, uh, provider type VLAN and provider type overlay on the same compute node, so we had to have separate availability zones for uh, each of these uh, uh, neutral networks. <clears throat> and the uh, people who sort of create their private network 
create an instance, put it in the wrong AZ, and you get a no valid host found. And then I'd ping everyone on Slack saying, this isn't very good. And uh, someone would report back, uh, oh, you've put it in the wrong AZ. We've resolved that. Since upgrading to Kilo, we've got a new version of OpenVS, which supports um, both uh, network types on compute nodes, and we've collapsed these availability zones down. We still have uh, an issue with users with AZ confusion, and they, um, uh, with Cinder, so they'll create a, a boot a volume on AZ1, and they'll try and boot it in AZ2, you get the same problem. And again, it's a sort of user education process that uh, Slack's really good at um, resolving for us. Um, ongoing, same thing again, education for uh, using uh, glance and deleting images when you've still got instances running, running that image, and they try and resize, and it, it comes back and says failed, uh, user education. And one of the main things that we find is that majority of the users who use the platform aren't very network-centric or know how networks work, so when they create their own network and routers and DHCP agents and um, address space, they, they don't always get it right, and it's, it's, it's a it's sort of education process to teach people, or train people up to know how networks work and how to create your own networks. I think a common one across the whole of OpenStack over the past couple of years is the confusion with the command line interface. So we, originally we would have all the separate command CLIs for Nova, Neutron, Cinder, et cetera, and the open, combined OpenStack CLI interface came along and it didn't have everything in, and uh, our, our users would go, you know, this isn't very good, it doesn't work here, and it does here, and it doesn't. Uh, we sort of mitigated this a little bit by creating an image that was public in our client's repository that had everything bundled into it, and the users could just copy their RC file across onto an image and use all the CLIs um, all combined. Um, so, so, sort of said it many times that the, 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 the OpenStack software is really good. It it's never seems to go wrong. It's just, it just yeah. works. And the majority of the issues that we receive from our users are, you know, I've deployed my database and my app and my web tier, and it doesn't work, it's your platform that, that is wrong. And we sort of have to do the DevOps role and go in and work out why they can't connect to their database in a different data center, or the replication doesn't work, or the web service can't contact the app service. And it's, it's generally a problem with uh, the end user not being able to deploy their application correctly. That's about it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay, if you have any questions, I think we Got a few minutes, possibly. One. One, two, okay. A lot. Four. There's <laughs> four of us. Well, there's four plus me uh, yeah. guiding them in the wrong direction. Everything. Everything. From deployment to administration to upgrades, add new nodes support people, um, because it, it's really hard to find, to be honest. Um, I mean, it takes a long time to skill someone in using all the components of OpenStack, so it's quite hard to find. It's quite hard to find, make sometimes the right people. And we are the regional team that yeah, yeah, will yeah. build the, our platform. So, so, so we architected it, we support it, we expand it, we do everything. You know, I was looking at that cool picture where you have these messy OpenStack. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is. Okay, so there's, there's a good point about that I didn't say is that we haven't modified the OpenStack code, right? So <coughs> we've just put uh, scripts or, or programs that do the interface. We don't, um, we don't want to modify the OpenStack code because we want to upgrade without any pain. So we've, we've just done this integration process. We did it a few years ago with VMware products doing exactly the same thing. And uh, doing it with OpenStack was, frankly, a lot simpler. Hmm. It didn't take long, right? So we, we didn't do it all in one day. The canonical support uh, is general. It's for the platform. And they provide also support for the Ubuntu instances that users create. Yep. But we see 80% of the time it's 
faster and easier for us to fix problems by ourselves, but not because we are genius, but, you know, uh, sometimes the error logs are quite um, clear, you know, where's the issue. And we had now, especially now, we had two years of experience. So we have a really good case of issues. And we know, sometimes we know, okay, this could be this problem, look here or look here. Because otherwise, you know, we, we do use Canonical, and you have to, you know, if you've got like a few hundred nodes and they want an SOS report from everyone, from every one of these compute nodes, it's, uh, it takes a long time, right? Yeah. For and things like QM or Libvirt, which is, I mean, it's really deep knowledge of the kernel of the packet, we are not, I mean, yeah. it's not in our skills. But the, open, the open stack software is open, right? So it, it, it does make it a lot easier. So we would log a call with Canonical, and they'll say, they'll give us sort of hints about where, where to look. And it makes, you know, it isn't like a, 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 a black box. So you can look inside it, and you can see what's going on. And it makes it a lot easier to even working with Canonical to resolve problems rather well. than, you know, just sending off like a, uh, <coughs> uh, an SOS type report to your enterprise vendor. and them coming back saying, oh, it's this bug, and it'll be fixed in six months' time. We can see actually what's going on. So it does so make it a lot easier to resolve things. Sometimes it's not easy, because as I said before, for, to configure designate, I spend really one or two months just trying to find how this option works. But during these two months, obviously, I've learned something, because, you know, Backup of MySQL and it's everything. Uh, we have a backup of all our configuration files. We keep we keep all that in Git, so we keep it all the config in Git, and we keep we do a backup of our um, MySQL databases into uh, object storage. That's all you need. So we don't keep like six years of it. We keep yeah. ten days. Right? Yeah, MySQL because you know how often. I know CP command. And right, well, it's, 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 it's a curl command to push it up to object storage. Okay. But all the configs held in Git. Uh, no, we can't. Well, uh, okay, so the, the sort of strategy behind it going back a couple of years was, you know, we looked at different products, right? And we looked at things like Cloud Stack, Cloud Platform, uh, from Citrix and OpenStack and uh, VMware and Eucalyptus, RightScale, all these things. And I, th I think uh, going back a few years, OpenStack was a clear winner, but there were still lots of the horses in the race. And we felt that um, having lots of other people using OpenStack, so uh, uh, Rackspace and lots of other uh, smaller companies popping up doing uh, public clouds using the OpenStack API. It was an obvious sort of, that's a strategy that we want to stick with. So we can deploy our applications using the same heat templates to either our OpenStack cloud or to Rackspace's OpenStack cloud without having to recode anything. So it's a, it's a sort of, we've gone on the OpenStack route to do things. Does that make sense? So if we want to scale out, we'd use the same heat template to deploy into Rackspace or into cloud or another OpenStack cloud. Okay, that's all. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Oh.